So today, we will uh, hold a webinar on the near tooth fluorescence imaging and how it opens a new window into living tissues for preclinical research. So first, we will um, explain to you how near tooth fluorescence imaging works, what are the advantages of working at these wavelengths. And after that, we will um, show you some of our technologies that can be used for near tooth imaging. To the exciting part, we will actually show you the system live uh, to image a mouse uh, that had an ICG injection, and we will perform some analysis of the results. And we will be uh, answering all of your questions at the end of the presentation. So first of all, let's uh, go over uh, some of the basics of uh, optical fluorescence. So fluorescence imaging is a very useful imaging modality that has a high spatial resolution that's very fast and easy to use. How it works is typically you have uh, some light that excites fluorophores, for example, that are embedded deeper into biological tissue. And these fluorophores, as they are excited, will emit light at another wavelength. Now, um, one of the major drawbacks of imaging in fluorescence is that the penetration depth can be very limited, mostly if you look into in vivo tissues, because the penetration depth, depending on the type of tissue you're looking at, can be limited uh, at a millimeter um, or a few millimeters. So if you want to look at deep organs within a small animal, for example, it's very hard to do so in visible fluorescence. Now, if you use near infrared, this allows you to excite a little bit deeper into the tissue. And you can collect light in the near infrared uh, that will have a little bit less absorption. And this will allow you to have a penetration that can go, again, depending on the tissue, it can go up to one centimeter, maybe two. Again, if you uh, do some imaging, for example, here we have an image of looking into uh, a mouse that had an ICG injection, and we're looking through the skull. This was done by the Bawendi group at MIT. And when he collects light coming back from the animal uh, and looks at 850 nanometers, we can see in the near infrared that we can vaguely distinguish some of the vessels, but we can still not see very clearly the microvasculature, which is, again, a big limitation for small animal imaging. Now, what we're presenting to you today is near to fluorescence and how it allows you to see very fine details. So here we're looking through the skull and we're able to see the microvasculature. Uh, the Bawendi group uh, did some detection at 1300 uh, nanometers, so letting only the light at this, this wavelength coming back to the detector, and you can see that the effect on the image quality is very dramatic. So it was shown uh, in a few publications that the penetration depth that can be achieved can be up to three centimeters into the animal. And now, um, this is very exciting, mostly knowing that uh, ICG, as a lot of you know, has a peak emission that's in the near infrared. So now what we're seeing is that looking into the near to, even if we only have a small tail of emission of ICG at this wavelength, we actually get an amazing contrast into the tissue. Now you may wonder, how is that? And how can you see cl so clearly at these wavelengths? So there's a few reasons for that. There's actually, there's actually three phenomena that are involved, one of them being absorption. So absorption is the phenomena where you shine light onto the tissue, onto the fluorophore, and the light emitted by the fluorophore is actually absorbed by the, the tissue, by the, the scatterers that are in the biological tissue and cannot reach the detector. So that's, that causes a, a decrease in the image quality. If you look into the different windows of imaging, so if you look into the visible from 400 to 600 to 6, 700 and the near infrared up to 1,000 nanometers, there is a, a very big absorption by hemoglobin into the tissue. Now, if you look into the near two wavelengths, that's from 1,000 nanometers 
to 1,700 nanometers, you can see that there's actually a very sweet spot where there is low absorption by the tissue, low absorption by hemoglobin and also by water if you uh, look from uh, 1,000 to 1,450 nanometers. In addition to low absorption into the tissue, in the near-to wavelength, there is also low scattering. So when you shine light uh, onto the tissue in the fluorophore emit light, the scatterers into the tissue uh, can actually uh, scatter the light and it will make a very diffuse signal that goes back to the, de the detector and the image will be very blurred. You can see again that in the visible wavelength, there's uh, quite a bit of scattering. There is also a bit of scattering in the near infrared and in the near two wavelengths, there is an important decrease in the scattering. And that's for many different types of tissue. In addition to low scattering and absorption, there is low autofluorescence in the near two wavelengths. So autofluorescence is uh, when you shine light onto the sample, it's not always only the fluorophores that interest you that will emit light. There's some endogenous fluorophores into the tissue that may also emit light and again, cause your image to be very blurred. If you do an excitation somewhere around 532, 785 or 808 nanometers, you can see that the autofluorescence is very low in the near two wavelengths and that allows us to get a clearer image. So in summary, in the near two wavelength, there is less scattering, absorption, and autofluorescence, and that yields a better spatial resolution, a higher penetration depth, and a higher contrast that can go up to three centimeters, depending on the type of tissue you're looking at. Of course, if you're looking through the skull, it will be a little bit less, uh, but it has been found uh, that the, the penetration can be 10 times deeper than visible imaging. Now, if we compare near to in perspective with other modalities for small animal imaging, of course, we know that MRI, CT, and PET can allow you to see through the entire body. But there is major drawbacks to using these techniques, such as the time it takes to acquire an image. It can take anywhere from minutes to hours to make an acquisition with these techniques. These are also very complex to use. It takes expert users and in the case of CT and PET, you also have ionizing tracers that are costly and also have an fast effect on the small animal. In addition to all these drawbacks, the, the cost of an MRI system, for example, is very, very high compared to the cost of an optical imaging system. Now, if you look into the visible optical imaging, you have a very nice advantage of having a high temporal resolution. So the acquisition can be real time. In milliseconds or minutes, the cost is very low, of course. But the drawback, as we saw, is typically that you're limited to imaging in surface. And now what we see is that we're, with near two, if we can achieve a penetration depth of up to three centimeters, what's interesting for preclinical pre imaging is that it means we can see almost through the entire small animal with a high temporal resolution, a high spatial resolution, and at low cost. So uh, if we sum it up again, having a high spatial and spectral resolution in the near two wavelengths, a high temporal resolution to see real-time dynamics, being non-invasive, non-ionizing, and having a good penetration depth can allow you to push the limits of preclinical imaging thanks to a combination of this fast, high resolution and deep imaging. So now we may wonder, uh, what can that enable? So a better resolution, as you noticed from the first images we showed of the microvasculature, um, a good resolution can allow you to see the microvasculature. It can allow you also to do a superior tumor delineation. Imaging faster uh, can allow you to monitor contact-free the heart and respiratory rate, as you will see later in this presentation. We also showed some applications where you can do pharmacokinetics, so look at where drugs go inside a small animal over time, where it accumulates, for example, and you can do that real-time. You could also monitor perfusion, blood flow, or do real-time surgery guidance. 
So there is also a big potential for near to applications in clinical application or for translational research as seeing up to three centimeters deep may be enough for many different applications in the clinic. Having a deeper penetration can also allow you, as you will see later, to do some metabolic imaging where you can see through the organs of the small animal and monitor different signals over time. Instead of looking at surface tumors or xenografts, you could also monitor deep-seated tumors and do some drug biodistribution. Now I will pass the presentation to my colleague, David, who will tell you a little bit about the technologies we developed for near two imaging. All right. Thank you, Emily, for this uh, great uh, explanation of the advantage of uh, NER2 imaging. So uh, let's go with uh, the technologies of Fatan, etc. So at the, the heart of uh, every of our uh, infrared instruments lies our Zephyr camera, um, which is really useful for, for NER2 imaging. But let's go back just a, 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 a quick step. Uh, in general, imaging, uh, bioimaging instrument, People usually use uh, like CCD camera or silicon-based camera, which uh, as you see here with the, the green line, the, the quantum efficiency, uh, are really efficient in the visible and also in the near one, but they have practically zero uh, efficiency in the near two uh, range. So we need something else. So this is, um, uh, this is a, a range that can be uh, detected quite easily with the uh, in, um, indium gallium arsenide sensor, which we call in-gas uh, sensors. Uh, they've been around for quite a long time, but they were limited mostly to uh, military applications due to, to some restrictions uh, for their use and also the high costs. Uh, but in the, the last few years, the costs went down and uh, they, they become increasingly popular to, uh, for scientific applications. And uh, of course, we have our own uh, camera, which we call the Zephe, which is made with the in-gas sensor, which is really useful uh, to, to check in these uh, wavelengths. Uh, and we also have a, 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 so we have a, a standard uh, in-gas camera, but we also have a special model, which has a sensitivity in the visible and in the near one, as well as, of course, the near two window. So this makes it a really versatile camera for people who want to cover the whole spectral range, especially if you want to do near one and also near two imaging. And I'd like to, to add uh, just a little point also that uh, now uh, it, it's been fairly recent that these uh, cameras have been available for scientific imaging and people are just starting to realize uh, what are all the advantages and the possibilities that uh, these kind of camera can open for research. So I hope we'll be able to convince you with the nice examples which are, are coming uh, uh, very soon. Um, so as I said, we have a nice camera. Of course, we put these cameras in our own instruments. Uh, at Photon, we develop uh, infrared microscopes, as you see uh, on the left side, uh, for uh, some in vitro studies. And we also have, of course, our preclinical imager that we call the IRVIVO. And basically, it's a wide field imaging system. So as you see here on the, on the small schematic, we have a near one illumination. We illuminate the, the mouse from, from the top. And then we have detection uh, through a lens, a filter wheel, and of course, our Zephyr infrared camera. Uh, so this is a standard uh, fluorescent setup. So we have uh, excitation, fluorophore in, in, inside the, the mouse, and uh, detection right here. This instrument, the AirVivo system, I'll go uh, quickly over the, the main features. Of course, it's the Zephyr and gas camera. Um, on the basic system, we have two uh, wavelengths for homogeneous near-infrared illumination. Uh, there can be more than two. It depends on, the, on the, the requirements. We have a variable field of view, which can ac accommodate up to three mice. Uh, variable field of view means that we can see three mice, but we can also zoom in on two mice, one mouse, or even zoom in on the, the head of the mice for uh, uh, brain imaging, for instance. We also have a XY manual stage so that we can center the, uh, the mouse on the, the region of interest. Uh, for the filter wheel, so that we can select the right filter for uh, the fluor fluorophore that we want to, to image. So this is the, our, our big instrument, and this is the instrument at the heart of the demonstration that uh, we're showing to you today. 
So let's go uh, right now in the de demonstration for the uh, near two imaging of a uh, ICG signal inside of a mouse that uh, that was injected in a mouse. So we have a small video. So if you just give me a second, I'll set the, I'll prepare the video for you. So here we go. So, uh, so it's, as I said, this is the dem demonstration of uh, ICG injection in a mouse and the uh, imaging uh, possibilities this uh, brings to you. So uh, the mouse is first uh, anesthetized in the induction chamber. And once it's uh, sleeping and uh, very comfy, we install it in the instrument. So we gently install the mouse and, and well, tape uh, the tape the legs uh, so that it doesn't move during the acquisition. And once uh, the mouse is ready, we prepare the uh, catheter for uh, the tail vein in injection of uh, ICG. So the injection isn't done yet. Uh, first, let's go through the different settings of the uh, instrument. As you see on the left, these are all the different settings uh, for, for the instrument. So at first, the camera, we set the exposure time. For this demonstration, it was 50 milliseconds. Uh, the, the binning, the high gain mode, we, we were using high gain for this uh, uh, measurement. The uh, filter turret, which is the, the filter wheel, we used a long pass 1250 nanometer filter. So that means that all the light uh, emitted longer than 1250 nanometer was collected. The field of view and focus, we can, um, we can move the platform up and down to zoom in, in and out of the mouse respectively. Uh, so we just select the field of view that, that we like. Then uh, illumination, we did the illumination at 780 nanometer with the intensity here at about 50% of the maximum value. So we can turn it on and off. So we also have at the bottom here, you'll see this is what we call the sequencer. Uh, it can be used to automatize the acquisition and the saving of the, the data. The, we can create custom sequence or or we can also provide them to our clients to perform, perform specific application. So in that case, we did a, a time-lapse uh, acquisition, but it can be acquisition with different filters or something. So uh, now the acquisition is started. We don't see anything yet uh, because there is no, the, uh, the ICG hasn't been injected yet. So it's gonna be injected in a few seconds and you'll see the signal that starts to appear. So that means that there's absolutely no autofluorescence before ICG. So there you see the signal. So you see at first it's near the, the heart, the lungs. We can see perhaps a bit in the lymph nodes. Uh, we had uh, here also a bit of signal, which is uh, probably the gall bladder. And uh, if we wait a bit, we see that the ICG starts to spread around the mouse. <coughs> Sorry. So after some time, we start to see really, uh, really well all the vasculature around the, the mouse, which is uh, quite nice. Uh, we see, we start to get some accumulation in the liver, also a bit in the bladder here. So um, we can see really clearly uh, the um, uh, different details in the anatomy of the mouse, which is really nice. And, and also keep in mind that, uh, as we said uh, just before, um, the, uh, we're using ICG, which emits, emits mostly in near one uh, wavelength range, and, and now we're looking in the near two wavelengths. So we're only collecting a, a small fraction uh, of the actual emission of ICG, and we still get a lot of signal, really nice uh, imaging, so that's, uh, we're quite excited uh, about that. Um, and also, I would like to uh, thank um, uh, Dr. Maria Moreno's lab in the Preclinical Imaging Laboratory of the National Research Council of Canada in Ottawa. They helped us a lot to prepare this experiment uh, to, to the handling of the mouse and everything. Uh, and what they do in RRC, they, they provide expertise in in vivo pharmacology and preclinical imaging for their industrial projects with uh, NRC partners. So basically <laughs> what we did here, they, they helped us a lot for this uh, video. All right. So that was just, just the beginning of the, of the acquisition. It, it went on for a whole hour, uh, but of course it would be too long to show it to you uh, right now. So let's go back to the presentation and, and start to check at different uh, analysis that can be done with, uh, with these results. So we, we have the whole one hour time-lapse video. So we can check now 
uh, from this video, we can easily with our, our uh, with our software, we can e easily select targets and place them uh, on the mouse, and then check what is the the temporal profile of uh, of uh, the signal at these these uh, specific locations. So, for instance, if you look at the heart here in red, you will see that at first it goes up and then it goes down a bit uh, with time. We can zoom in. So this is the the, the whole one hour uh, acquisition temporal profile. We can zoom in at the beginning. And we see here that uh, after the injection, the first uh, the first parts where the signal appears is uh, around the lymph nodes, the heart, the lung, and then after a little while, we see that the signal starts to accumulate uh, in the liver, also in the bladder, and uh, quite interestingly, the liver it it's, uh, it really stays uh, in the liver for a long time. You see that after an hour, uh, there is uh, still a lot of accumulation of signal inside the liver. Also interesting, if we look uh, near the, the intestine, uh, we see uh, a lot of signal at first because there is some ICG going everywhere uh, in the extracellular matrix of the mouse. Uh, then it goes down, and then we see it coming back up again. And this is the point at which uh, the liver starts to excrete the ICG through the intestines. So it goes, uh, it goes here, and, and we, we can actually monitor the excretion of ICG. Uh, from the body, and we'll we'll talk about that uh, again a bit later in the presentation. Um, all right, nice things that we can do uh, when we do uh, these analysis. We can do a monitor of uh, heart and respiratory rate uh, contact free. So I presented to you in the previous slide. Uh, we can put um, we can put target at specific places. So let's put. Let's put targets on the heart and uh, other place uh, near the lungs or just around the heart. And let's check what are these uh, uh, temporal profiles. So we see on the top in the red, this is the heart. So we can clearly see all the heartbeats and also the, uh, the, the respiration at the bottom. We see uh, like nice, nicely uh, shaped peaks that give uh, all the respiration of, uh, of the mouse. And uh, we can even uh, play around with these and do a frequency analysis to try to extract from this data the, the, the heartbeat and the respiration rate. So once we did that, we found that we had uh, uh, about 50 breathing per minute, so uh, almost one per second. And the heartbeat in this mouse, it was about uh, 280 beats per minute, uh, which is a, a bit uh, lower than, than uh, what we have for uh, awake mice. So this is normal because this one is anesthetized. So we, we expect that it, it will go down a bit. So it's um, really interesting to see that we can do these, uh, these measurements just through optical imaging. There's no contact. We don't need any probe inside the heart to be able to do these measurements. Other things that we can do, uh, as I said before, um, we see that the, the, the signal doesn't appear at the same time everywhere inside the mouse. So if we go here, about seven seconds post injection, we have mostly in the liver. Uh, sorry, we have mostly in the lungs uh, around the heart. Some art, some some vasculature, which is probably arteries in in that case. And then if we look a bit later, we see a lot more vasculature. So perhaps uh, the veins in in that case, we start to see accumulation in the liver. Uh, and also if we go much much later, about half an hour after injection. We see that the signal fade out everywhere except in the liver, and then it starts to go through the uh, the intestine here. And uh, of course, we can play around with these images and stack them together for a false color overlay image, uh, which we see here. Uh, so we can uh, have a nice indication of different uh, different anatomy anatomical uh, elements uh, in the mouse. And uh, now let's let's play even uh, even let's have even more fun with these. Uh, so we have uh, for every pixel of the image we have the temporal profile. So we can use some um, algorithm that can do analysis of the, the all the temporal profiles that uh, that we have inside the mouse and tries to find some um, some patterns. Tries to uh, locate some of these uh, some of the temporal profiles which look alike and. and try to categorize a bit. So uh, one such uh, algorithm is called the uh, principal component analysis. So we, we tried that, and the uh, principal component analysis can output some nice images of uh, similar um, 
temporal profile, which uh, kind of uh, show up some some nice features in in the mouse. So we see on the image of the on the left, we can see some lymph nodes appearing. Uh, the other image here, we, we can see the uh, salivary glands of the mouse quite quite well, as well as a lot of vasculature. This one is really enhances the the vasculature of the mouse. Uh, and in the last one, we can see also the bladder and a few other things. And then again, we can stack them all together in order to get a, a nice uh, multicolor image. So unfortunately, the, the, uh, it seems like the conversion for the presentation has a, a bit uh, degraded the quality. Um, so perhaps we can try to send you the, 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 the real image, which uh, looks more much more crisp than that one. But even in the... Uh, monochromatic image, you can see that we have really crisp, nice details of uh, the whole mouse. All right, and then what else can we uh, do for analysis? We can check uh, if we go more in the vasculature, as I said, seven second post injection, there is some vasculature appearing. So we expect this is, this is probably arteries, although we're not absolutely sure. And uh, after uh, 36 seconds, we see other, um, other vessels appearing. Uh, so we cannot tell exactly which are arteries, which are um, veins in, in that case, but we can for sure do a mapping where we see the regions where uh, the signal appears first, so in red, and then the regions in, in blue where the signal appears uh, a bit afterwards. So this, is, this can be quite interesting to try to study um, some pharmacokinetics or just the, 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 the blood flow uh, inside the mouse and uh, doing other studies like that. Okay, so now another interesting part. Uh, as I told you, we just presented the first few minutes of the, um, of the uh, injection and the acquisition. Of course, one hour is, is too long, but we have prepared for you a, a super accelerated version of the, the whole video. So let me just go select it, and uh, we can look at that together. So if, if, if I start it, so of course, really fast, uh, we have the signal coming in, and then you see that the signal fades out uh, around the mouse and accumulates uh, in the liver. And then after some time, it was about half an hour, we can see that the liver starts to excrete the signal. And we can even see a bit of the peristaltic movement uh, inside the intestine. So um, after an hour, we have uh, still some, some, a lot of signal inside the liver, but we can clearly see that the excretion has uh, started and is going through the intestine. And of course, it would have been interesting to make the imaging uh, even longer and try to, to scan the whole intestine, but uh, for, for the mouse, we, we were considering that one hour was quite enough for, for the poor little mouse. Uh, so again, so we can clearly see what's happening in the intestine. So let's go uh, try to see so, some more analysis uh, here. So if I advance to the next slide. So as I said, uh, we can zoom in on the, um, on the liver and, and, and try to see the, uh, the movement uh, inside the intestine. So if you bear with me just one more second, I have another video for the zoomed in uh, movement. So this is what we saw. So this is uh, not accelerated anymore. This is a live uh, live view, and you, you can clearly see some peristaltic movement. As uh, so, let's pass it again. So as the ICG, uh, well, actually the, the material advances inside the intestine. So this is uh, quite interesting to see. Uh, so this is again some some kind of periodic movement. So we were interested to see if we can try to do some frequency analysis again. And we found out that we have uh, actually two peaks. So one around 47 contractions per minute and another one around 24 contractions per minute. And uh, actually the, the one at 47 is, uh, agrees quite well with what we found in the literature for the uh, um, contraction rates for peristaltic movement. And the one at 24, we don't know exactly what it is, but there, there could be some interesting science to, to study here to try to, to find uh, what's happening. Um, and of course, uh, so as you see, this is just a, 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 like a crop of the whole video because we, we did only one, one mouse and we tried to do all the analysis on that. 
But of course, it's possible with the instrument to zoom in even closer to, to this area. So if, if we want to do a more uh, detailed analysis and imaging of the endosine, uh, it's uh, entirely possible to do. And uh, then one, one last uh, analysis. Now we're just having fun with, uh, with these uh, measurements. So as you see, then again, sorry for the uh, uh, quality of the image. Uh, it, it was su supposed to be a bit better than that. Uh, but with uh, our software, we can put targets here at the beginning of the, uh, of the intestine and then another target a bit later. And we can check the temporal profile. And, and we see that the signal uh, arrives first at the first point and then a bit later at the second point. So by looking at the, the time delay, we can uh, even uh, compute what is the, the, the speed of, uh, of, uh, of the traveling of the material with ICG uh, going through the intestines. And uh, in that case, it was about uh, close to 300 micrometers per second. So these are like nice, uh, nice uh, little analysis that we can do with, uh, with the system. Um, so that, that concludes this, uh, this part of the, the, the presentation, the, the whole demonstration. I hope that you find this, uh, this to be as exciting as, as, uh, as we did. Uh, we're really impressed and happy with, the, with what can be done with the instrument. And of course, we're um, asking for you, for your, uh, your imagination to find even more interesting application and analysis to do with our, our uh, instrument. Um, so now I will pass the presentation to uh, Emily for the conclusion. Thank you, David. So thank you all for joining the presentation today. In addition to the exciting imaging we showed you with ICG, there's actually a lot of different applications that can be uh, carried with near two imaging, including drug discover discovery, cancer research, metabolism, hemodynamics. You could do image guided surgery thanks to the high spatial temporal resolution. You could also do translational research if you imagine eventually moving on to, for example, uh, intraoperative imaging or cancer detection. You could also monitor the cellular environment. So we have uh, a lot of uh, collaborators, such as Dan Eller, who developed carbon nanotube-based sensors that emit at different wavelengths. And that allows you to detect different drugs, detect, for example, the lipid content. And we can also add to our system a tunable filters that allows you to spectrally resolve these phenomena. So there is basically an infinity of possibility um, that opens up thanks to the high penetration depth and high spatial temporal resolution of near two imaging. And we're really looking forward to know what you want to do with near two imaging. So we're going to have a little survey to ask you what applications you're working on, what you think near two imaging could be useful for um, in the case of your, your project. And we're going to pass to that uh, survey, and then uh, we're going to start reviewing your, your questions as you fill out the, the survey. Uh, feel free to also contact us anytime after the webinar. We would be happy to discuss together your applications and uh, what you thought of this, uh, this demonstration. So. Uh, okay, so so uh, okay, so we'll start with a, a few questions. So, a question from from Jim: um, Do you filter your excitation or emission light? Um, so, the the excitation is not filtered. Uh, we use lasers uh, at specific wavelengths, but we do filter uh, uh, the emission light. So, this is the the filter wheel. Uh, we can actually uh, you can put whichever filter you want in the in the filter wheel. Uh, and then, so you can use band pass for if you want to look at a specific uh, um, uh, wavelength window. You can use uh, long pass if you want to look a, a bit, uh, collect a bit more, um, <clears throat> a bit more light. So yeah, so there's a filtering at emission, but not excitation. All right. Um, next question from uh, Sota. How much is the lateral and axial resolution? So um, lateral resolution, it, it depends on the, on the field of view that uh, we're, we're using. 
So the field of view for three mice is about uh, is about 125 millimeter wide. So each pixel actually uh, covers about uh, 250 micrometer uh, of the of the maps. And if we go in the uh, in the the, the, the full zoom, uh, the field of view is about four centimeters wide, something like that. So each pixel covers about uh, 80 micrometer. And for the actual resolution, that's a, it's a bit more tricky because uh, we're not. Uh, this is not a, a, a like a confocal system for which we have a, a sectioning, optical sectioning in the z-axis. So it's really a whole field imaging. So in that case, we 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 talk more about um, uh, depth of field. And in that case, for the um, different uh, setup that we have, the depth of field. Uh, in zoomed out is about a bit more than one centimeter, if I remember correctly, and uh, zoomed in it will be uh, maybe a f one or two millimeters. Uh, I, I can check to have uh, more precise values if, if 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 you want. All right, next question. Aha. That is a great question uh, from Chen Chen here. So ICG, is it a typical near one contrast agent or near two contrast agents? Um, so typically it was always used as a near one contrast agent. As you noticed from the absorption and emission curves we showed earlier, the peak emission of ICG is in the near one. So it's not uh, meant to be a near two agent, although we have so shown in that demonstration that even just the, the tail emission of ICG is actually quite enough to get very interesting results. So are there near two nanoparticles that were commercialized? The answer is yes. There is, uh, there is quite a few that are being uh, commercialized. There's more and more of them and we work uh, very closely with companies and researchers who develop them. So uh, depending on your, on your needs, we're, uh, we're very happy to, uh, to help you finding the right uh, near two nanoparticles. And there's uh, many different types of uh, nanoparticles. Maybe I can go to a supplementary uh, slide. Just a second. So I can show you a little bit the types of, uh, of different probes uh, that are available out there. So just like, uh, like ICG, there's other small molecules that uh, normally emit, have a peak emission in the near one that still have a nice tail in the near two. So these can definitely be used. And now in the near two, uh, there's some small molecule probes that are being developed. There's also more and more quantum dots that are available and that our tunable filter is able to spectrally resolve. So we can see many different quantum dots at the same time in a small IML. There's also many single walled carbon nanotubes uh, that are being developed. There's rare earth nanomaterials that emit at these wavelengths, aggregation induced emission dots. So there's a lot of different options out there and we're happy to, um, to go over that with you. So now I will uh, go back to the, to the questions. It seems like we have many, many questions. So I will try to answer a bit more, more quickly. And uh, also just to let you know, we'll make sure to get back to you uh, after the webinar if we don't have time to answer everything. So um, if the question is, uh, this question here from Stefan is, uh, what machine is good to record absorption and fluorescent spectra of near two dyes? So if you want to actually get the entire spectral information, we do have a tunable filter that allows you to do spectral imaging, where for the entire field of view, we can actually get the, the spectra for each point in the image. And we have that option for both our hyperspectral microscope, um, the preclinical imager that you saw in vivo, and we're, we also offer a plate reader that you can use to do that. Question from Sota. Do you supply the ferrofores for in vivo imaging, or please tell us the recommended supplier? So there is a lot of options out there. And we can certainly uh, help you and provide you with some of these uh, near two ferrofores. So 
Uh, it would be very interesting to discuss together to see what kind of applications you work on so we can determine what uh, fear of force you need and we can direct you to the, the optimal uh, supplier. Okay, so uh, again, another question. Um, are there other chemometrics or statistical analysis, and can we get the spectral data loading spectra and scores in the PCA? Um, so I'm, I'm not sure I understand correctly. So, so the, the, in the presentation that we've, we have done, the PCA was done on a temporal profile. So it, it was temporal, um, uh, temporal data. So it was temporal dependent PCA analysis. Of course, if, uh, if uh, you have a hyperspectral version of our instrument, you could do hyperspectral imaging and then you get the spectral data of all the, the probes and the fluorophores that are inside the mouse. And you could do uh, like spectral-based PCA on those as well. Um, and for chemometrics or statistical analysis, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't know exactly what, uh, what is meant uh, by that. Maybe we can review uh, exactly uh, what you want to do and we can show you uh, what kind of, kind of analysis can be done with our software SpySpec. So um, there's a, a lot of uh, different uh, add-ons for, uh, for analysis and uh, we can see based on what you need. Okay, a question from Mark. How many filters can you have in the filter wheel? Um, so it, uh, we have different options of filter wheel available, but uh, for, for uh, the, the, the basic instrument, it's going to be about, uh, I think it's 12, 12 different filters that can be used. Uh, okay, a question from Joshua. What long pass and band pass filters are available on this setup? So basically, uh, we don't have um, we don't have a predetermined set of filters. Uh, so if uh, if the client has specific needs, we will use these filters. So if the cli client already knows which um, uh, which probes he wants to image, and, 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 and if we can determine the, the best filter for, for these, we can go uh, with these filters. Uh, Sometimes what we do is that we provide a few filters and we, we keep some empty spaces in the filter wheel. So if the, the client wants to add his own filter and, and be able to change them, this is a, a possibility. Um, so in the, the system that we've presented to you, uh, we had like the long pass at 12, 15 nanometers. We also had uh, band pass, so it was not used for the, 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 the demonstration, but we, the, we provided the, the system with a band pass around 8, 15 nanometers for near one imaging. And also at, uh, I think it was 10, 50, 12, uh, 50, and 13, 50 for near two imaging. But it can be really um, actually customized for the clients. So do we have one more question? Okay. Uh, how many frames per second the system can get for real-time imaging? A question from Chen Chen. Um, so it, it all depends actually on the, uh, on the amount of signal that you get uh, because this will impact on the uh, uh, exposure time you will need to use. So if you, don't, if you don't get a lot of signal from your dye, you have to expose for a bit longer. Uh, if you get a lot of signal, you can expose for a few milliseconds. So the camera, uh, if you expose for really, really short times, the camera can go up to, I think it's more than 200 frames per second. So if you, if you want to do real-time imaging, you could go at 200 frames per second. Uh, it will give you big, big files, uh, but this is a possibility. Uh, in the presentation that we did, we had, uh, so as I said, exposure times of uh, 50 milliseconds. And uh, considering the readout and everything uh, of the camera, the, uh, the uh, frame rate was about 12.5 frame, frames per second. OK, uh, question from Stephen. Do you have excitation wavelengths uh, higher than 900 nanometers for new fluorophores? 
Uh, this is a possibility, so um, uh, we can uh, install lasers which have uh, emission higher than uh, 900 nanometers. So this, uh, depending on the fluorophore, if, uh, if it has a strong absorption higher than 900 nanometers, uh, of course, it's a good idea to go uh, with uh, excitation wavelengths like that, and this is entirely possible. And also, I just wanted to mention, uh, we can customize the illumination wavelengths based on your requirements and we can have uh, easily uh, three different uh, wavelengths available for excitation in one system. Uh, question from Yeni, do you have any head and neck near two images? Um, so, so we don't have, uh, we don't, we haven't done them yet uh, on this instrument. So, so we, we only had, um, we only add one 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 shot for one mouse, but of course it's possible to do if we can if we want to zoom in, we can zoom and have a much more detailed image of the head and neck of the mouse uh, for this imaging. I also uh, wanted to mention uh, so we've actually already done some near two images of uh, the head of a mouse, but uh, not with the preclinical imager. We had also uh, done that with our infrared microscope. And uh, we can we can basically achieve a very high uh, resolution uh, zoomed in on the head with that. So uh, that data was not uh, published yet, uh, but we we hope that we can share that with you soon. Okay, a question from Jacob. How does the sensitivity of uh, of uh, our system in near one compares to IVIS? So um, I, I guess uh, most of you guys know what is IVIS. It's the uh, preclinical imager and the, the visible. Um, so it's like the, the gold standard for, for uh, preclinical pre pre imaging in the visible range. Uh, and their system can go in near one. Our system is optimized for near two, but is also sensitive in near one, as I presented with our, uh, our cameras. Um, so, so we haven't done a um, uh, direct comparison comparison of the both systems, but uh, we know uh, about the what is the illumination intensity of, uh, of the IVIS, also the their, the kind of lens they use and the uh, camera quantum efficiency. So, by comparing those with our system, uh, we know that the sensitivity should be quite similar. So, any uh, study that is done in near one in the IVIS. Uh, should should be possible to perform in our system with similar uh, quality of results. So let's dream together. <laughs> so first, what would you do with near two fluorescence imaging? We mentioned a few, a few applications that can be carried with near two, such as early detection of cancer biomarkers tumor imaging, looking at microvasculature, drug distribution, cellular environment with spectral imaging, looking at burns and perfusion or other applications. So uh, I invite you to, uh, to select the application of your dreams. And also there's probably a lot of different applications that were not carried yet and that, uh, that are possible with near two uh, imaging. So please tell us more about uh, what you do, what you would want to do and uh, we're very eager to, to know your answers. Also, if you if you want to know more about these different applications, uh, there's a, there's a lot of material we, we could share with you, and we could uh, we focus a lot on ICG today. But uh, we're very happy to share more about near two applications with you in a in a further discussion. Thank you all for attending, and we really look forward to uh, to discussing with you and knowing more about your applications.